we're going to go ahead and get started here on our first demonstration. Maybe our first trainee is ready. Serena, would you be ready to um, talk to our audience? Oh, yeah. Of course. All right. So how about you first tell us about you wanna... yourself? Oh, you lead us okay. Through poster. Hi, everyone. I'm Serena. I'm currently a student at the Immers Lab, um, a student at Stanford University, and over the summer worked on this project. It's called the Mixed Reality Neoprobe. And basically, in cases of head and neck melanoma, surgeons want to remove the central lymph node to see if there is a tumor inside it. And currently, they use a neoprobe to like look around the area and find where the radiation source is most high to like figure out approximately where the location is. So I built a program in Unity on the HoloLens that sort of tries to display the um, tumor and the surrounding radioactivity in virtual reality, or mixed reality, I guess. And um, basically, uh, Here's how the system works. You have a HoloLens, you have your computer set up the program, and this is a 3D printed version of the Neoprobe. And do using- Do you have the 3D yes, printed I version Yes, I do here? have it here, yeah. It's right here. I'm still figuring out the logistics and connecting it to the laptop, but this is 3D printed version. Um, here's my Unity program. And ideally you're wearing the HoloLens like on your head and you match the 3D version to the one in the program and you move it around. And so you would say there's like a tumor here. You would move it around and when it detects the tumor, it like probably I have to hold the mic. Sorry. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, it would, you would have to like, it, it sort of display um, like through filtering the particles at different locations where the most probable location of the tumor is, so. That's yeah. awesome. Are people going to get to demo it? Yes, hopefully, if I can get it to yeah. work. Yeah. Okay, then maybe I'll let you go. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Serena. This is super cool. We'll let you, yeah, prep. Looks like people are ready to watch your demo as well. I'll move along. Feel free to touch. Is this. Is this your station here? Yes. Can I get you to introduce yourself on the mic? Sure. So this is being live streamed. Okay. Um, so my name is Chris. I'm from the 3DQ lab. Uh, we mostly do uh, 3D imaging and quantitative analysis um, of CT and MR studies for the adult and children's hospitals. On top of that, we also do 3D printing for um, surgical planning and patient education, basically anything that the clinicians want us to do, we'll try our best to achieve it. We have a variety of uh, different types of hard and soft materials. We can mix them in any, um, in any combination to get models that are clear uh, with color, models that are flexible. Um, Let's super, can I touch it? Yes, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, wow. Yes. Oh, that yes. is super cool. What type of material is that? So this is a material called Agilis by Stratasys. Right. Yes. And this kind of model came off the same printer as this one, as this one, as this one. What was the printer? The printer that we have is called the Stratasys J735. It uses a 3D printing technology called a Polyjet. So it basically like is a... Think of it like an inkjet printer. It spits out material layer by layer, by layer and then cures it as it sweeps through. So that's how we're able to get the different types of materials and uh, different colors. Sweet. Mm -hmm. These are so cool. I'm just gonna let the camera go on them. Sure, Can you sure. Tell me, like, what's the like, what's the kidney one for? Like, what what are maybe you could guide me through each of them? So this is a model that we did as a proof of concept uh, for. Uh, kidney donors. So one of these kidneys was eventually donated. Um, this is, you usually scan the donors so that they can figure out which kidney is the best one to, um, I don't want to use the word harvest, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to take. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this one is an educational lung model that one of our uh, radiologists asked for. It's got airway in white, um, arteries in red and then veins in blue, and then the clear, the clear materials, just, just the lung tissue. Um, this brain model has electrodes in it. This is for 
uh, post Rosa procedure for epilepsy. So we provide these models for the uh, clinicians to verify the depth of their electrodes after the um, after the the procedure. This one is another proof of concept. Uh, and unfortunately, we don't have the printer that can do this or this. These are printed by HP as proof of concept models for us. Um, we just wanted to see what we could do with their printer. Unfortunately, we don't have any space for their printer. Otherwise, we would have it. Um, just vessels in the head along with the cranium. This one was for plastic surgery. I think these, from what I can remember, this one's particularly old. It's for um, vascular reconstruction. She wanted all of the tissues in um, that area of the leg visualized for her. This one took days to print. It is quite heavy. If you want to pick it up, you can. It's like a very expensive paperweight, but you've got bone vessels and muscles. There's one highlighted muscle here. I forgot the name of it, but she was particularly looking at that one. So that's why we made it a different color. Otherwise, the other muscles are just blue. And then um, the rest of the tissue, like fat, is in clear. Uh, these two models are for breast reconstruction. What the surgeon does is uh, they will use these models to locate what, where the perforators are so that they can um, decide which, uh, what tissue to harvest. So you, there's fat on top of um, this muscle and they'll harvest the muscle based on where the vessel or where the vessel location is. Uh, usually they harvest below the umbilicus. That's why uh, we only provide below that. What's the, the grid pattern under for? The grid pattern is for them to... So this is um, a specific surgeon's request. Uh, it helps her locate and correlate between the model and the, the actual patient. So these models actually go into the OR with the surgeons, um, but this... The, uh, the surgeon that asked for this one is more hands-on. So it's actually in a bag in, uh, in, in the sterile field. We are working on getting uh, sterilizable prints so that they don't have to put it in a bag. Um, but usually these, these colored ones are, are not sterilizable. These are also proof of concept models. This is a heavily calcified mitral valve. You can see white is all the calcium. And then you can even poke your finger through and see uh, how little that budge is. Yeah. And it's my finger stuck. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a, another model that was printed for us by HP um, to, this is a type B aortic dissection um, Flow, I think she was studying flow analysis. So this is one of our researchers on campus asked us to print this. And so we kept one of her, one of her models. But usually we print for her in this material. Yeah. It just works out better. This is a little bit too stiff if you wanna, um, oh, wanna squeeze it. Yeah. Well, so this is, so it's nylon, but the, the upside to this is it's super uh, resilient. So you can yeah. squeeze it and you can bend it and it won't, it, won't, uh, it won't crack or deform. So this one is a uh, cryoablation grid, also one of our clinicians' research projects. This, sorry, prostate cryoablation. So um, there's a little shelf that goes here, and this uh, is positioned right below the scrotum um, to help the, the surgeons better aim their cryoablation needle. Um, it's used in, in MR, so we can't, or it can't be in metal. It has to be in some non-metallic material. Is that visible in an MR scan? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. That's neat. Yep. Thank you You're so welcome. much. This is fantastic.
few technical malfunctions. We're going to continue moving on and checking out more of the demonstrations here. Hopefully you can hear now. I'm just struggling with my camera there. Do you want to say anything to our live stream audience, Brian? I'm just checking out the demos, so I'll I'll have more to say soon, I hope. Cool. Let me see. So the beginning was like uh, just uh, can you introduce yourself to our live stream viewers? And so the microphone is the only thing that can be uh, hi, I'm Trisha. I'm a third year bioengineering PhD student at Stanford, and I'm working on augmented reality for head and neck surgery with Dr. Nicholas Blevins and Brian Hargreaves. Awesome. Can you tell us about your project? Sure. So um, right now I'm focusing on methods for tracking and registration in augmented reality for head and neck surgery. Uh, in general, these kind of surgeries are usually um, done under the microscope and very space limited. We use tracking hardware such as electromagnetic tracking in order to know where everything is in the surgical field, such as the patient head, um, the microscope, the surgical tools. However, we, all, we always have issues with these kind of trackers because of electromagnetic interference. We have inaccuracies. So in order to improve the tracking and the registration of augmented information, such as uh, preoperative CT scans, we are proposing to use uh, vision-based algorithms instead, or to combine them with electromagnetic tracking in order to improve that registration and have a better accuracy in surgery. Very cool. So what type of technology are you using? Are you using the Holland? This is the Holland here. No, uh, so today I'm using uh, an Oculus. What I'm demoing today is not exactly my project, but it's uh, a side project that was done in the lab. Um, so, yeah, uh, the, uh, the poster is what I presented to you, the electromagnetic tracking, but the, the actual demo is going to be, um, it's uh, an app that allows you to import uh, CT data and then uh, go through the scans and also have a segmentation that was previously done using uh, convolutional neural networks and overlay these kind of segmentations in 3D on top of the CT scans. Uh, and then what you can do is that you can analyze these, uh, use some tools in the app where you can measure distances between different structures in the body. And uh, you can see that uh, under virtual reality. And uh, this can be used either for training of surgeons or also before the surgery for surgeons to analyze the anatomy of someone in particular and then have a very personalized treatment or uh, surgery afterwards. Awesome, cool. So if you do the demo, can we see it on the computer? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, do you want to, or you can try to get a volunteer to do the demo as well, and I'll try to record the video screen. Okay, should I, should I look for someone else? What, what do you think is easier? If you do it, yours? easier if I do it. Yeah, okay. And I might hold the microphone near you so you can, wait. Sure. Yeah. You should tell me if you can see what I'm seeing. Yeah, so Trisha's just going to do a demo for us. Oh yeah. And yes, I can. Can I get you to hold the microphone so you can yes. talk while you do it? Here's okay. the microphone. Yeah. Here's Trisha um, doing her okay. demo. I need the other uh yeah. here. Oh sorry, it's just the left one. Okay. Thank you. There you go. All right. Okay. So we go to load folder. 
And then you can see here uh, the files that you have. And then you can choose, for example, this one and then load it. And then you will get the CT scan over here, along with all the segmentations that have previ been previously done using convolutional neural networks. Uh, over here, you can, for example, go through the different scans. And then you can drag any of these structures that say, okay, let's see, let's see the cochlea. Okay. I'll get it over here and then I can bring it closer to me and I can drag it here. And then let's move this. When you go through the different scans, you can get to where the, the cochlea is actually located. And you can also have other structures overlaid. This is super cool. Yeah, this is an amazing app. Okay, so let's say now you want to analyze the cochlea and see some kind of distances and the particular distances and um, dimensions of the cochlea. You just click here on evaluate cochlea. And then if you look back here, okay, I don't see it. Where is it? Let's see. Okay, can you see it? Oh yeah, that's super cool. Yeah, you can see it over here. And if you, you can see like certain markers that indicate particular landmarks in the, in the cochlea. Um, and that will allow you to, for example, take certain measurements that can help you personalize, help the surgeon personalize the surgery before the, uh, before the surgery for a particular patient. And here you can see that analysis, like the different markers that you saw, you can see over here where they are located, particular dimensions. You can also use, for example, this wand and add markers over here. Sorry. Okay. Let's say this, these two markers. You can pick this up. You can bring it closer to you and you can see where you put these markers and then let's put it back um you can um i forgot where there was that one was exactly but you should be able to get the distance between these two points mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I forgot what the it could be this one. Let's try. Okay, exactly. So this wand allows you to find the distance between these two markers that you just put. And then you can also grab it, bring it back closer and look at that again. And you can put these markers wherever you want on the anatomy and uh, try to analyze and get certain dimensions that you would need in surgery. Oh, sorry. Yep. And yeah, that's, that's almost everything. Uh, you can also evaluate the facial recess, which is very similar to the analysis of the cochlea. Uh, so you would just uh, grab the facial recess and other structures that you need, and you can do the same thing. That's awesome, Trisha. I'm just going to turn my mic off for a second for our live stream people. My phone is slightly on the fritz, but um, we'll get to the next demo in about a minute.
Okay, we're going to be moving on to the next demo here that we find someone who's available and wants to share their work for us. Can I jump in? So we're live streaming right now. Could you introduce yourself and tell people what you're up to? Oh, sure. Okay. Um, I'm Rachel Nadick. Uh, I'm a junior at Stanford studying computer science. And what I decided to make was a augmented reality application for rehabilitation. So um, the first thing, I don't know if you can uh, show my computer screen here. Um, the first thing I decided to work on was uh, this body tracking thing. I felt that it could be cool to um, create an application where um, you could do like full body exercises and uh, create like gamification, gamification elements out of it. So um, the first thing is a proof of concept that I did was using this device called the Azure Connect. I uh, did uh, figure out how to do body tracking and um, it, or mirror those movements onto an avatar and track squats. And you could imagine that you could create a game out of that. Yeah, so there's a device here. I don't know if you can see it. Um, in on perched up on the windowsill called the Azure Connect. So that's an external device that's capturing my movements and displaying that onto my HoloLens as an avatar. So you don't even really need a mirror. You can see um, your posture and everything. And then um, uh, I realized through that process, though, that at least at the moment, the way I have it set up is it's a little impractical because you would need to hook this up to a computer every single time to, to track your movement. So I decided to switch over to more hand tracking related uh, exercises, which is used a lot in stroke rehabilitation. And there are a lot of really, really boring exercises like um, there's a finger flexion exercise, for example, that's really, really boring. So I have a, a video that I can show you of that. So let's see. It's amazing. Right. So you can basically just showing how we might go about making these really boring movements, something a little bit more fun. So you flex your fingers out to smash the monsters and it gives you information about how much you were able to bend your fingers and how many of the monsters you successfully smashed. That's awesome. Yeah, I think the next steps would probably be to focus more on the hand exercises and upper extremity exercises to improve um, stroke rehab, uh, like, or to improve adherence to stroke rehab plans. I think that there are a lot of a lot more hand exercises that we could create fun game for games for to help stroke patients. Cool. Thanks. Is there anything else yes. you want to say? Before, uh, um, I th I think that's it. If anyone has uh or has any uh, comments or questions, you can reach out to me on r n a i d i c h at stanford.edu. Very cool. Sure. All right, thank you so much. Cool, well, we're gonna move on to the next demo in about a minute here. So I'll turn on or turn off the microphone for a second here while I just get comfortable.
Okay, we've still got lots of people here and there are lots of demos going on. Actually, I'm gonna come over here. Would you mind introducing yourself to the mic when I pass it off to you and you can tell us about your project? Hi, uh, my name is Alyssa Ling. I am in the Brain Interfacing Lab with Professor Paul Nujukion. And uh, my poster is on Markoless Point Cloud Pose Tracking. Um, and to give it context, so my partner Michael over there, um, we've done this project jointly together. And so this is half of the project and he's the other half. Um, it makes more sense if he explains it first, oh. and then I, it, yeah. <laughs> Should I bug him now then? Maybe, yeah. Okay, maybe I'll go, I'll try to bug him. So Alyssa says to go bug her, uh, her collaborator here, so we'll go do that, and then I'll return to you, Alyssa, in a second. I feel like if the monkey is with the back to the camera, then it's probably not be loud, right? This is a camera. Wow. Oh, okay. camera. Oh, okay. And so when you have this kind of a, a two hand, there will be more than two cameras in that same locker at the same time, and that's all you need. So I did the sound of the website was not... Maybe we'll actually move around to someone else since it looks like they're busy. Hello? Can you tell me about your project? So this is being live streamed right now, so I'll pass over the mic if you're good with that. Yeah, no worries. Thank you very much. Yeah, so the project we have here is around using the HoloLens or mixed reality glasses in general to um, communicate with your computer and perform day-to-day -day functions like cursor positioning, clicking, and things like that. In particular, we were um, drawn to this project after observing um, uh, people with limited mobility um, struggle with using their mouse, uh, trying to like click it all day because it does cause body strain over an eight-hour uh, workday. So we're trying to see if we could use the readily available information from the gaze and voice input from head mounted displays to control what you see on your screen. Um, and to kind of do that, we kind of started up kind of setting up a screen space. Uh, that's why the, what you see here, we use QR codes um, around a PC device to create a screen space for you to work in because the information as to where you're looking at on this screen, on this plane, once you define it, is readily available, pretty relatively easy from the HoloLens standpoint. And the big hurdle was going, to, was going to be trying to translate that information to where you put your cursor on the screen. To do that, we set, set up uh, five calibra uh, calibration points on the start page of an app on your computer, which then uses the native functions inside your computer to map out where you're looking when you click at those points or where you put your cursor. Uh, and when you say where you're looking, it's like following your gaze. It's following your gaze. Very yeah, cool. so what the user sees on their end is they see a white dot that's connecting with somewhere on the screen. And then uh, in setup, you're moving your actual cursor to those points. And then once you click on the point and you're looking at the same point, the app registers that position. And then we're able to use a simple linear regression model to just calibrate that to be a one-to-one -one, but where you can sit back now, keep your head still, and look anywhere on the screen and you're able to move your mouse to that position. The next, That's so cool. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if there's a way for me to like show this very well on my computer, but I do kind of like show it a little bit. Yeah. And, um, So, oh, sorry. So you can see the the dot, the white dot moving around. What's also following the white dot at this point is the mouse of the computer. So then you're able to then give voice input about clicking and like typing certain things. So that's the next step of the project is trying to add those capabilities. Um, while also adding a couple filtering things to kind of make the, the transition of the eye movement more fluid. Because uh, sometimes you do have your eyes have the problems of like having saccades, like moving really quickly left and right and things like that. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where the project is right now. Um, hoping to keep it going after the class as well. Yeah, so you were in the grad school Yes, I was. I was in the grad school school. Are you an undergrad or grad student? I am a first year grad student. Uh, oh, nice. Yeah. In mechanical, mechanical engineering. engineering? Yes. And are yeah. you... Doing just a master's or you're doing a PhD? PhD, PhD. Pardon? PhD. PhD. Nice. Yeah. And so yeah. who's your advisor? Uh, Alison Okamura. Oh, sweet. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, so I guess you saw her when yes. she was at Bethany Yeah, while ago. <laughs> exactly. Well, this is super neat. Hopefully, we can keep the immersed 
connection of with course. the charm lab going as well. Of course. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Is there anything else you want to say about your project? Um, no, and other than like, I'm just excited about it. It's just, you know, for me as someone that wanted to come into grad school and learn how to make really cool things, it's useful to like also know that it's going to impact people in a positive way. Uh, yeah. So when interacting with my users, you can definitely tell us has a positive impact on like their day-to-day -day lifestyles, which is very, very inspiring for me to keep doing the project. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much. We're going to go check out a new demo and I'm going to turn the mic off here for a second. Our next demo with Michael. Michael, I'll let you introduce yourself. Okay, sounds good. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Michael Silvernagel. I'm a, a PhD student uh, at, the, at the Brain Interfacing Lab uh, under Paul Nujukian. Uh, and we study uh, motor cortex uh, in, uh, in, in primate models. Awesome. Yeah. Can you tell us about your project? Uh, for sure. Um, so I guess maybe a bit of background to, to put this in context. So historically in our field, uh, a lot of primate experiments have been been performed in these sort of partially constrained setups where you have neural data being recorded uh, and you have sort of one limb that's free to move um, and you pair that movement activity of the limb uh, with the neural activity. Um, and that's because, you know, a lot of these setups in the past have, you know, involved a bunch of wires that transmit the neural activity and, and you know, markers uh, and you don't want the animal to, to take off any of the wires or, or the markers. Um, and while this has given us a bunch of useful data, um, it's a bit of a contrived setup, uh, and it doesn't reflect the animal's, you know, natural motion. Uh, and so we want to move to a, a, a freely moving platform. And to, to accomplish that, we want to do it in a markerless fashion. So we uh, have spent the last few years uh, making this experimental setup that uh, is outfitted with four Microsoft Azure Connect uh, RGB depth cameras. Can you uh, point out where those are? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, so you have your uh, okay. RGB cameras uh, yeah. up top, up here, uh, and then you have uh, panel antennas that receive the wirelessly transmitted neural activity uh, as, the, as the animal moves. Um, and so if you go down, uh, go down slightly, um, so this is our experimental enclosure, and then from a single camera, you have your RGB data, uh, and then, you know, a, a depth map uh, that, you, that you also capture. And so using the depth map from each camera, we can use the intrinsic values of each camera to, to create a, uh, a three-dimensional point cloud. Um, and then using an iterative closest point algorithm, we can align those point clouds together uh, to create a 3D representation of our scene. Um, and so having this, this stream of movement data, well, we can align it in time with our neural stream. Um, and so we can track how neural activity modulates as the, as the animal moves. And so uh, here you have a, um, a spike raster. So this is from the implanted electrode array in the animal. Um, each, each channel is detecting spiking activity from a neuron. Um, and each vertical line represents a spike in time. Um, so a, a neuron's firing. And so you have channels and then spikes over time. Uh, and so we can align that with the animal's motion uh, as, it, as it moves. Um, and so as we conduct future experiments, uh, we will be looking at, okay, uh, quantifying this, this motion activity and seeing how you know, neural activity uh, is affected. And then hopefully at one point be able to decode movement from just the neural activity. Um, yeah. This is super new to me and super out of my field. Sure. How do you even process this data? Sure, sure, sure. Um, and so what you have uh, from, from the electrode array, you have an analog waveform. Um, and so basically uh, a voltage over time, right? right? Um, and so if you go, uh, you know, you, you filter it, then you can go and you can see um, what, we, what we call like a spike train. So each time a neuron fires, it creates an action potential. And we can just think of that as a, as a change in voltage. So if you measure the voltage around the neuron, you'll see an increase and decrease. So it goes sort of up and down. Um, and there is a, a threshold of activity. So like, okay, you have the, the, the waveform sort of go up and down. Um, you'll know that, okay, at, at a certain point, that isn't gonna be just noise, right? That, that actually is, is, is a marker where the neuron is firing. And so we go and just you know, create some voltage threshold. And if the voltage crosses that threshold, we know we have a spike. And from those spikes in time, 
um, we can create these spike rasters. So all these vertical lines just denote when a spike happens in time. Um, and so yeah, so it's 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 a way to take you know sort of this information intensive analog data and to make it into something that's still very useful, but you know um, from an information perspective, uh, less information. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so um, then uh, I know Alyssa so sort of has a sister poster, and she she handles how we actually extract sort of movement information from these three-dimensional point clouds. Um, yeah. And yeah, so we'll go over there next time. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. Anything else you want to say for our live No, no, just th thanks, for, thanks for listening. Uh, yeah, and I guess if you want to check out the work, uh, we recently published in Science Robotics uh, in the September issue. So, awesome. Yeah, yeah, I will check that out. Okay, Thank awesome. Thanks. So much. Now we'll move over to Alyssa with the sister poster here. Hello. Return to Alyssa, I should Hello. say. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alyssa again. I am Michael's uh, partner in this project. And so as you've heard from Michael about our setup and motivation, um, the two big uh, innovative elements of our project is one, the synchronous um, wireless electrophysiology with the point cloud data, which Michael explained. And then the second um, big innovation was the markless point cloud post tracking algorithm, which is what my poster is about. Um, so to give a bit of a background, there's not really an out of the box solution for large ambulatory animals like markerlessly. Um, Deep lab cut, if you've heard of that, works on uh, rats really well, just because rats are smaller and they only need one like camera angle to get all the poses. Whereas we wanted um, like a much larger animal in a much larger space. And so we needed more than one camera. And so deep lab cut didn't work very well for us. Um, and then the types of pose estimation that exist are like a purely geometric approach, which is what I did. And then there's also a deep learning approach, um, which a lot of human pose estimation uses, and they are able to do that just because there's so much data of humans moving that they can learn really well on that, whereas there's no data of monkeys moving. And so we couldn't do that either, which is why we used a purely optimization geometric approach. Um, so I coded this in Python and used Blender and an articulated skeletal model. So if you see here, this is, um, the articulated skeletal model I used to capture walking data of two macaques walking back and forth, which is the task we wanted. And so um, the way I created this skeletal model was I took the point cloud data that Michael explained um, for one frame, transformed it into a mesh and mesh lab, and then segmented out joint locations that I wanted. So for example, if you wanted to like fit the right arm, so this would be the shoulder joint, the elbow joint, the wrist joint, and since meshes are um, volumes, you can algorithmically determine if a point is within that mesh using ray casting. And so the algorithm um, use ray casting to count the number of points within each mesh. And as these bones rotated around different joint angles, then um, it would maximize the number of points within that mesh to get the correct joint angle um, location of the wrist. And so that's what this algorithm did down here using the gold standard that you're comparing to so our gold standard if you see like this algorithm accuracy is um since since there's not many labs doing this type of project there's really no um like gold standard other than like hand labeling data and so all of these um all these three platforms that we compared against mm -hmm. had um different types of algorithms algorithms they use which they also compared to hand labeling so that's where our like paper results came from like we hand labeled data on the point cloud ourselves and then compared it to the algorithm joint locations but um as you can see our results did um comparably or better than the previous papers very cool that's yeah awesome. Yeah, and so here are our results. Um, these are two different macaques performing the walking back and forth and reaching tasks that we want to explore. And so um, this would be, these are 30 frames of uh, like stance and swing phase, and this is 60 frames of it. Um, and if you look closely, you can see like this trajectory would be a stance phase. 
And then up here would be a reach phase. And so line diagrams like that's just like modeling of the, the hind limb. Yeah. So so this is um, I think if I look correctly, it goes left leg, right leg, um, right arm, left arm. And so these are all four limbs doing like an, a quadrupedal walking task. Wow. And so what we want to explore with this behavior is we want to compare the difference between a swing phase and a reach phase. And so um, the kinematics show that they are like kinematically similar, but the actual intention behind that movement is very different. Um, because like a swing phase, you're trying, it's just like a regular walking task where it's stereotypical and you don't have to think that hard. Whereas a reaching task is you're like intentionally reaching towards food to pick it up. And so we're trying to see if there's like a neural difference between those two kinematically similar tasks. Um, oh, that's super neat. Yeah. And, oh, what's this last part here? and so this generalized behaviors just shows that since our platform is so large um, and like our monkey is completely freely moving, he can perform any kind of generalized naturalistic behavior and we are able to fit it with our articulated skeleton. So in this figure, this is, um, our monkey was just sitting down, a fly kind of buzzed past and he like quickly, swiftly reached up to get it. And then we were able to fit the kinematics for it. So this would be his, um, I think, right arm up, left arm up, and then right arm downreach, left arm downreach. And so these types of behaviors were not able to be shown in any other platform before. That's awesome. Yeah. This is super neat work. Do you have, do you have anything else you want to share with our live stream audience? Uh, next demo? Uh, no, but uh, thank you for listening. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so thank much, you. Alyssa. And I had a great request to show, highlight the titles and authors. So I'm just going to leave it there and feel free to make more requests to me as well. I'm trying my best to watch the chat here. Awesome, thanks Alyssa. And I'll go and highlight the last poster's title and authors as well for anyone who wanted to capture that. And then I'm gonna turn the mic off here for a second while I find the next demo. at the next demonstration. I'm going to hand the mic off and I'll let you introduce yourself and your project. Okay. Alrighty. Uh, hi, my name is Jasmine Palmer. I'm a third year PhD student in the mechanical engineering department. Uh, my project was on uh, making a mixed reality simulation for a lumbar puncture procedure. Um, so essentially, uh, I imported a model of human anatomy and then um, I tried to render the forces that approximately should be occurring at the fingertip, I mean, sorry, at the needle tip, and then um, rendering that feedback to a wrist-worn device. Um, so my environment's mostly just, um, uh, well, at least for the haptics part, is the skin, the bone, and um, the uh, approximate like brain stem area. Um, there are some inaccuracies in my model, so it's um, a lot of it's an approximation. But um, I did the calculations based off of a modified version of uh, the Ziles and Salisbury God Object model, um, where I have these two points in um, the space that I can keep track of at all times, one of them remaining on the surface of the mesh and the other going into the object. And from there, I can measure the penetration or the distance between them. And then that's how I end up calculating the forces that are acting on the yield tip approximately. Um, I used Hooke's Law to um, render that force information, and then um, I used that information to send a position command to the servos that um, are right here. Um, and so when you put the needle into the skin, you feel a certain amount of um, force um, related to the position that it's um, pushing into your skin. Um, and then as you go deeper, you feel more force. And then if you hit a bone, you feel a lot of force, which is um, an indicator that you're doing something wrong. Um, and then <laughs> when you reach the... Um, the brainstem and get to the cerebral spinal fluid, then you feel essentially um, a release of force because you've encountered a fluid and um, that effectively feels like there's very little force acting at the tip. Um, and so the device should retract entirely so that you feel approximately no force there. Um, and uh, yeah, that's um, the procedure and the um, simulation that I created. That's super cool. Can you walk our audience? <laughs> Thanks. Oh, I was gonna check. Oh, wait, there was a question. Do you mind if I just take a second? Yeah, go ahead. And read the question. 
Yeah. There are also more calcified spines, especially in the elderly. Will you be able to simulate that at some point? Uh, that would be amazing. Um, so the model that I have was essentially a um, just um, a given model. Um, it wasn't based on any real MRI data. There are ways to take MRI data and then segment um, portions of it, like the spine, um, and then um, import those into Unity, and then from there do those kind of calculations. So that's certainly possible. Um, it just does add a lot more complications and a lot more um, intensive like modeling that would have to be done um, in addition to it. But uh, yeah, that that hopefully would be possible in the future. Awesome. And one, I'm just gonna sorry. Mm -hmm. Harder to follow. This sometimes my phone is on the periphery. <laughs> yeah, of course. It says, oh yeah, spine force feels different with aging spine. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. And keep the question, or you can say keep the questions. I don't know if people can hear me. You can tell them that they can keep. Oh the yeah, you can keep online. you can keep the questions going if you'd like. Do you want to like tell us about um, your equipment down here and what it does, just for people who are unfamiliar with these uh, technical components? Yeah, you might want to look at the device design yeah. section for the camera. That might be the easiest to see. So yeah, I have two one degree of freedom devices. There, um, there's a tactor that's actuated by what's called a rack and pinion mechanism. So there's a small servo motor that um, just rotates and then it's connected to the tactor, which then um, allows you to um, push into the skin. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's really all there is about the device. Uh, it's 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 simply one degree of freedom. So there's um, all it can really do is provide pressure. Um, uh, if you move it, actuate it fast enough, it could simulate a, like a kind of vibration feedback. But that wasn't my intention with this. So um, yeah, it's mostly about pressure-based feedback. Awesome. So is this part of like your dissertation, or is this class project? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so the devices are especially for my dissertation work. Um, for the dissertation, I'm working on like mapping the dorsal and ventral sides of the devices to um, specific forces acting on the index finger and the thumb. Um, so that is a bit more complex, and the modeling I do for the fingertips um, for that experiment is a lot more complex. But um, for the sake of this, I made the forces essentially equal on each of the servos, um, so that um, you could just get an idea of just like if you've hit bone, if you've hit skin, if you've um, reached the spinal cord. As well, so yeah. Awesome. All right, you're getting lots of questions. Oh wow! Awesome. <laughs> Yay! So, uh, asked, Jasmine, can you expand on your investigations on haptics? Uh, yeah. Um, Maybe like could, have you explored like have you explored like different devices for haptics or like more like are you thinking like like future more advanced devices perhaps, like different approaches oh, at all, I guess? Oh, yeah, so um, I played around with like other devices in our lab, like the Phantom Omni, which is um, a kinesthetic feedback device. It's essentially like a pen-like tool that's connected to um, a, um, like, uh, what is it? It's two um, linkages and they have like um, advanced torque motors and force sensing on that. Um, so that's really interesting. Um, that's a different class of devices than what I'm working with. Mine are called tactile devices, since they um, focus on actuating the skin. Um, whereas kinesthetic devices like the Phantom Omni are focused on um, like larger scale motions and proprioceptive feedback. Um, I'm also looking into like different ways to mount those um, devices I showed you better um, and be more wearable and more robust. Um, and then I've also looked at other types of devices that provide shear forces to the skin. Um, so, um, so that you can add another degree of freedom of feedback. And also I've looked at devices that add um, torsional degrees of freedom to the skin. Um, those are still in development. Um, and whether I um, like have the model to uh, accurately like determine like what forces go to which degree of freedom is something I'm still working on as well. Okay, mm -hmm. Jasmine. Unsurprisingly, you're very popular. So <laughs> um, someone said, Bravo, how can we contact Jasmine? So I'm going to highlight your email address. And that's yeah, of, of, of course, yeah. And while I do this, you also have a question. What are the other use cases for the pressure feedback? So let you say that while I zoom in. Yeah, on so. Your email. Yeah, so um, the main inspiration for this was actually medical training. So um, one of the issues with medical training um, is um, the use of um, needing to work with either patients or proxies. So with patients, um, obviously they provide the most realistic um, interactions that a student or a trainee are going to um, have. However, um, you know, some people that are patients don't necessarily feel comfortable having a pretty young student working with them, or um, if there's a mistake, then obviously that can be catastrophic. Um, or resulting complications. Um, and then um, proxies um, can often be expensive or single use. So like early in the panel, um, one of our speakers talked about um, cadavers being something that are extremely expensive and essentially single use. Um, not that this would replace cadavers, but um, you could possibly um, simulate um, like 
performing certain procedures on them if you have like an accurate um, or convincing feeling haptic simulation for it. Um, so yeah, medical training is the main um, inspiration for this kind of project. So like with the lumbar puncture, even though I wasn't able to work with the palpation, I, I mean, like render the palpation um, part of the procedure, um, that's a procedure that relies on a lot of haptic feedback um, between um, touching and looking for the L4, L3 and L4, I believe, and then finding where to put the needle and then also feeling how deep the needle should be going to reach the cerebral spinal fluid. So um, yeah, uh, it's applications like that are, that are interesting. And then also, um, the pneumothorax procedure is one that someone in our lab has worked with, um, where um, the simulating how the needle feels going through the skin, the fat, the muscle, and then eventually into the lung cavity um, to try to relieve the pressure of, um, in, uh, in the case of a collapsed lung. So that's another interesting application that we've worked on in the lab. Um, and uh, those are the main ones at the top of my head I can think of. Um, yeah, so mostly medical purposes. <laughs> Thanks. And I don't know if you can hear me, but hopefully you got Jasmine's contact email address. Do you want to just like spell out your email address? Just in case? Uh, yeah, my email is my first name, first initial, um, J-A-S-M-I-N P at stanford.edu. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, of course. So much, Jasmine. This is like super fascinating work. Thank you. I love it. People are very interested. We're going to take a break while I look for the next demo. We'll give Jasmine a break too. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, there's one, sorry, we were gonna let you go. Someone says, at Jasmine, haptics for medical and surgical procedure are essential to progressing our field. So, sounds just like very positive enthusiasm. Thanks, I appreciate it, thank you. Back at our next demo, I'm going to let then you both introduce yourself. Do you both want to share this? Yes, so only the person with the mic will be heard. Okay, um, so I'm Kevin. I'm a second year master's student in bioengineering here at Stanford. Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Wei Yun. I'm right now a second year E master's student. And I'll, you can start talking, but I'm going to highlight just your title and your email addresses so people can see them. Gotcha. So our project aims to use mixed reality technology to help with MR-guided cryo ablation therapy. So the cryo ablation therapy is a minimally invasive treatment that uses extremely cold needles to freeze and destroy abnormal tissue. And after talking to uh, the surgeons at Stanford Hospital, we identified a few complications that we may be able to, may, we may be able to help with mixed reality. The first is that surgeons cannot observe the real time position of the needle inside the patient body during the procedure. And the second is that surgeons planned for the uh, needle placement based on 2D MR images, while the actual placement is done in 3D. So it would be great if we can display the MR scans for the surgeons during the therapy. And our aims for our project are first to check the location of the needle uh, with respect to patient body in real time, and second, to visualize the 2D MR images according to the position of the needle with respect to patient body. Yes. 
and we'll have a quick demo yeah. to show. Sorry. I was on the fritz the whole time. This is too much for one phone to be handling. Yeah. We're good. This is cool. Okay, so you're going to show us the demo on your computer. Yes. Sorry, I'm just going to block. Yeah. One second. Oh. Cool. Do you want to give us some background just while he's setting up here about what's going on? Yes. So we're using the um, OptiTrack system right here. It's a motion oh, capture yeah. system to track the real time location of the needle that we use. And the tracking is done um, with infrared um, markers. Yes. So our project involves um, several components. Um, and the first. Okay, we'll be back in a second. Uh, <laughs> I was gonna check my battery, it should be okay. Okay, we'll continue. Okay, sure. So the first thing you say, uh, you see um, the blue thing is a, sec it's a 3D rendering of the, M uh, of the 2D MR scans of a patient's thigh. Um, and above that is, is the 2D MR scan. So what we're trying to do is to use the OptiTrack system to track the physical probe um, and relay that location information into Unity. And based on the location of the needle, um, needle tip, we're constantly updating the corresponding MR scan above the segmentation. Yeah, very cool. Mm -hmm. Have you worked with any clinicians on this? We have uh, we've, we've consulted a few uh, surgeons at the Stanford Hospital. Yeah. Yes. Oh, we got a question. How small a needle can be tracked with the OptiTrack? And can this be combined only with MRI? And I just have to pull up the rest of the question. Only with MRI or also with ultrasound? Um, could you use different imaging modalities I with this? Or does that have to be an MRI scan? I believe so. As long as we can make, uh, as long as we can make the segmentation work and yeah. then relay that segmentation onto the patient body. Yes. Right. So you just need like decent signal from the different tissues you're segmenting and decent resolution then? Yeah, yeah, based on the purpose of the segmentation. Yes. And then are there limitations on the size of the needle? Um, I'm not aware of that. So okay. this is the actual needle that is used in the surgical procedure. Yeah. And this is just a representation of the needle that we use. Right. That um that come come with the OptiTrack system. Look at this, please. You really touch any needle. Yes, we can That's attach the, the marker. Thing. Yeah. It's really okay. good. Those so OptiTrack sorry. things are tracking the, a needle there's position another question. in real time. Lots of questions on this. Are you doing this in real time things. relative to the static reconstructed image? So I think that it's the MRI image. It's a static red. Red. Yes. Yeah. But you could do it in real time with ultrasound, maybe, if you could get a good enough image. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, questionable future research. I do ultrasound all the time. Good. Lots of questions. People are interested. <laughs> the rationale behind this is that surgeons um, do the planning based on based on preoperative imaging. Right. So we're trying to relay that back onto the patient body to, to use yeah. during the procedure. Yes. Yeah, let's go for it. I'm trying to think, is, do you think there's a best position for me to be in to capture uh, everything? Or closer to the computer or further? Maybe you should. Yeah, and maybe let's show. So you've got your HoloLens one on. Yes, we we'll have our HoloLens on one. Yeah. And then the probe for um, the OptiTrack system. So the first step is to align the physical, uh, physical probe with the virtual one in Unity. We're using voice command to. Um, Some are using Unity. Uh, Fix one. All right. So the green dot represents the tip of the needle. Just one. Just one. Just one. Fix one. 
Big love. All right, and then based on the position of the tip of the needle, as we move it, we update the MR scan above the segmentation. And we can also use hand manipulation to move the segmentation to uh, overlay it to the patient, to the physical patient body. So this, this, this segmentation is a representation of the patient's thigh. We're able to scale it and, and move it. That's, that's, it. that's it for our yeah. demo. Very cool. That's awesome. So if we adjust the probe, the corresponding MR image change based on the location of the needle? Yeah. Oh, that's super cool. Good one. Yeah. 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 Oh. Yes, as we move the probe, um, the MR image will be updated based on the position. This is super cool. So was this class project or this is your dissertation work? Class project. Nice. And are you both graduate students? Yeah, We're both master's students. Master's, uh, master's transitioning, PhD or master's? We're applying to PhD programs. Nice. Program well, yeah, here, of course, right? <laughs> yeah, good choices. Cool. Do you have anything else you want to tell our live stream audience? Um, that's it for now. Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much. This was super cool. I'm going to highlight their names one more time and the poster, just in case anyone wants to contact them after. It sounds like you guys are looking for PhD advisors in case there's faculty that are listening. <laughs> cool. All right. Thanks so much. We're going to continue to see if there have been any demos we've missed so far. So I'm going to turn off the mic and keep moving around here. At our last demo, 
and I'll, I'll let our last trainee introduce themselves and tell you about their, uh, their project. All right, uh, my name is Wally. I am a first year PhD student in bioengineering and this is the product I've been working on for the quarter. It is augmented reality neural navigation for transcranial magnetic stimulation. So generally when you think about treating the brain for ne different neural disorders, there's two methods that come into mind. There's one that's drug delivery and pharmaceutical drugs where that way you, you can target different biomolecules that may be associated with different diseases. And the other is brain stimulation, where you just stimulate the brain to help make uh, different neural circuits more active. So one method that people have been talking a lot more recently in literature is the brain stimulation where you implant an electrode in the uh, person's head. And then that way you can stimulate the, uh, stimulate the brain. But that procedure is both invasive and still in the works. Uh, there's one alternative, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is the focus of my project, that is entirely non-invasive. It uses a magnetic coil that you use and you place on top of the patient's head. It fires a magnetic pulse, and that induces a current in the brain that allows you to stimulate different parts of the brain. Uh, oh, sorry. So the problem with TMS, though, in the actual clinical setting is the fact that in a clinical setting, it's a little bit hard to use in tar accurate targeting of different sites. Uh, most clinicians use what's called the five centimeter rule where you place it, try to place it within five centimeters of a patient of the ideal target and you fire anyways. The idea with our project is we will use augmented reality to help circumvent this to provide accurate targeting of different stimulation sites. So we actually have our project on two different devices, the HoloLens 2 and the Magic Leap 1. Uh, for the purposes of this demo, uh, I'm here with another person, Emmanuel. She's the one who works with the Magic Leap. But uh, for the purposes of the live stream, I guess we would just should go ahead and show off the HoloLens. Yeah. So, uh, I guess we can go ahead and do a spoiler alert. Uh, so right here, uh, so normally there's usually a registration procedure. So what people do is you might see all those different spheres. Uh, a person normally puts in, uses a registration procedure to put in all of those spheres on different landmarks of the person's head. So that, and if we have a virtual model of a patient's head, we can align those points that we put on a person's head to this virtual model, which then allows us to put a brain on top of their real head or a virtual model of the brain on their head. And so that's the steps that, uh, that's past the point, this Part of the project already, you can see they've already registered the brain to the head. Uh, the other step would be then to actually uh, fire a probe. Uh, oh, sorry if you don't mind me grabbing this. So uh, unfortunately, we do not have an actual coil right now, but for the purpose of this, you can pretend that this is a TMS coil. So the idea behind this is. Uh, with this little marker, we can actually track where the probe is in real life. And then we can actually uh, go ahead and start in the actual procedure, we can place this on top of a person's head. And then normally there is a button on the probe, we press that and it fires. Uh, we do not have an actual probe, but we can actually simulate a firing event. Uh, <laughs> Oh, on the screen? Yes, because yeah. something will happen. At least I hope something will happen. Uh, I'm going to put it here because it should be clear. All right, so you should see uh, there's now a purple line. Uh, and so that actually indicates the area that we have fired upon in the brain. So that right there with us tracking the probe, we can actually figure out, or it is possible for us to actually figure out what area of the brain that we end up firing upon with the stimulation probe. The red dot, which is right below the purple line, the color of that actually corresponds to the uh, magnitude of response. So normally when you fire a probe, for example, in the motor cortex, you a muscle might end up twitching because of the stimulation that activates part of the brain. We can measure that response and then use that to kind of get an idea of the effect that we have on the brain. And the color of this 
little dot that we have here will correspond to the magnitude of the electrical signals that you have that you end up measuring after firing the TMS coil. And so that is pretty much the idea behind our demo. Doing some PMS stuff as well over. Oh, who was the other person doing PMS? Uh, are you talking about in the class? In the class, yeah. Uh, Laura. Yes, it was Laura. Did you work with Laura? Uh, not as much. We were planning on integrating our projects in if we had the time, but uh, quarter systems go by pretty fast. Yeah. And you also get someone saying we're very excited for it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, or tell the live audience. well, it would be nice if we got to show the magic leap side of it, but unfortunately, uh, it is not as easy to showcase that. So I apologize in advance. Yeah, another time. <laughs> another time, another time. Cool. Well, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Wally. Um, yeah, it was my pleasure. We'll... So thanks again, Wally. Um, I'll turn off the mic for now. I think we've got most people, but before I leave, I'll also let Christoph sign off to our live stream audience. So you can stick around for another minute maybe here. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Wally. Now my mic is on, yeah. So thank you very much for everybody who followed online to check out all the demos. All the recordings will be online. And please be back to the next panel. That's that time probably again, just virtually in about two or three months after holidays. Thank you very much. And maybe, is it on? Yeah, I'll just add, um, before we officially sign off, I know I didn't do a great job at the beginning of highlighting the names of everyone, so if there's anyone, any of our live stream audience would like to talk to, just contact any of the organizers and we'll connect you appropriately with the, uh, the individuals doing the really cool projects. Right, they can contact us. Yeah, right, and then they should have your emails from uh, the email for the yeah. live stream audience. So yeah, just reach out to us if you wanna get in touch with anyone who has a really cool project that you saw today. But otherwise, thanks, have a great afternoon.